What do you pray for? You pray for the world? Or do you pray for, I'm sick, I need healing. How many know he'll heal us if we're sick? What do you pray for? Would the world be a better place if he answered all your prayers? Or would you just have a bit more comfortable life? And so that kind of touches upon what I want to speak about. And I want to take you right back before time began. I'm going to go right back before God even made an angel, before he made anything physical, before he made the universe, certainly before he made Adam and Eve, and show you that the Bible talks about that, and it has to do with God's eternal purpose. Everybody say, understanding God's eternal purpose. And this is a series. I'm going to begin today. I'm going to continue it for however long the Lord leads us. And I'm going to start in Ephesians 5 and 29. Chapter 5 compares a man, a husband, and his wife with the Lord and the church. Um, how many know the church is called the Bride of Christ? In fact, right here it is. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. All the women said amen. amen. <laughs> but think about it for a moment. But nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we, somebody say the church, church. are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then it says something very powerful. You might have read this many times, but it might not have grabbed you like it could. For this cause. In other words, there's a cause for what he's going to talk about next. When he said that we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, that is a cause for what we're going to read next. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. And then he pauses and he just sums up what he tried to tell us. This is a great mystery. It isn't just talking about a man and woman get married and that's nice. He said there's an awesome, awesome truth in that. It's a great, huge mystery that God's contained just in the fact that he has a man marrying a woman. And he said the mystery is concerning Christ and his church. In other words, Christ and his church are the cause for a man to have a wife and get married. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. Adam was made long before Jesus Christ ever came along and before any church existed. And you're saying Jesus and the church which only happened 2,000 years ago, was the cause for God to have Adam have a wife? In fact, when Paul said, we are bone of his bones, talking about the church and Jesus, we're flesh of his flesh, that's the same words that God had Adam speak. She is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And so when Adam made those statements in Genesis chapter 2, Paul said that was caused by Jesus having a church. Now, we know there wasn't any church then. Jesus hadn't come to earth yet. But how many know God saw the end from the beginning? He saw millions of years into the future. I mean, he's eternal. How many know that eternal means you have no end? But what else does it mean? No beginning. Can you stop and think about that for a minute? God has no beginning. He's the only one, the only thing that has no beginning. Everything else had a beginning. Angels had a beginning. You and I, the earth, the universe. In the beginning, the Bible talks about in Genesis. In fact, Genesis means beginnings. But before all of that, when God was all alone, when there wasn't even a universe, when there was nothing physical, he had something in his mind. And he said, I'm going to make a universe, I'm going to make angels, I'm going to make creatures, I'm going to make an earth, I'm going to make a solar system. And he says, there's something, there's a purpose that I have that I'm going to bring to pass. 
And so let's thank God right now for his word. Father, I thank you, God. I give you glory. I pray that you speak. Open our eyes. Open our understanding. Lord, of all times in the world, we can't be backing down now with what's going on in North America. Of all times, we can't be loosening our righteousness. We can't be loosening our discipline. There's too much going on in the world. Father, in Jesus' name, get a hold of every heart here today. You're coming, Lord. You're on your way. Very soon we'll be out of here. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, make everyone ready here. Let this meeting be part of it. And, Father, I give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Let's clap and give him thanks. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You might be here for the business meeting. You might be here for the sermon. You might be here because you want to hear the singing, the worship. You want, might want, you just serve God, so you're here. But not a one of you were here by coincidence this morning. I promise you that. If I've ever felt that before, I feel it now. Paul said the reason there is marriage, the whole reason he made it so that a man would leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and become one flesh is a message concerning Jesus Christ's body, the church. And Walter already said it this morning. See, I told you things will come out that God's orchestrating this meeting. We are the body of Christ. And something about God's plan was placed in his purpose of a man and a woman getting married. And it says a man is driven he will leave his father. He will leave his mother. And he'll search for that wife and cleave unto her. There's a driving force in every man that's ever been born. And it's a message that God is also driven. There's something driving God. There's a hunger in him. And how many remember? I just said a little earlier, how hungry are you? Now let's go to back to Ephesians 1. And let's see, let's get a better idea of what Paul's talking about here. Ephesians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be you, to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And watch this. He starts right off the bat saying some very vital things. See if you can catch it. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And everybody say the next two words with me. In Christ. Say it again. In Christ. Did you know that in Christ, there's every spiritual blessing you could ever imagine for you? God is a big God. He can do a lot. And he has chosen that there's only one place you're going to be able to get all of his blessings. It's in Christ. How many are glad you're in Christ? Are you in Christ? That's where all the blessings in heavenly places are. They're in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him. Everybody say in him. Amen. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Before there was, forget about before there was you or even your parents or grandparents. Before there was Adam, forget that. Before there was a world, God had you in mind. They say, I just did a story for the radio about how abortion is the highest reason for death in North America. And the pro-life people walked in Portage last weekend. And that went over the radio. And how many know the Bible says, I knew you, I formed you in your mother's womb. So before you were born, God saw you. He knew you. That means you're a person. So how many know abortion's murder? Well, forget even that. Before you were in your mother's womb, before there was a world, you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Somebody say, God adopted me by Jesus. According to the good pleasure of his will, 
And I want you to say this next phrase with me. To the praise of the glory. Say it. One more time. To the praise of the glory. To the praise of the glory. That statement right there is powerful. I'm going to show you why in a moment. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Say, in Christ. In Christ I'm accepted to God. In Christ I'm holy and unblameable. I could never be holy on my own. I could never be holy enough. I could never do enough good. If I had to do good to get heaven, forget it. I'd be in hell. And same with you and I, all of us. Only in Christ we're accepted of God. How many know he gave us his righteousness? How many know he gave us his goodness? I'm as good as him because he gave me his righteousness. It's a gift. You can't make yourself good enough to be righteous. He had to give it to us. And he only gives it to those who are in Christ. How many are glad you're in Christ? Woo! So he made us with a need. And specifically he's talking about the men. And of course all, everybody has a need. But he's using that as an illustration. Adam was seeking after something that was missing from his body. And, and all of us were created to seek after a missing piece. How many know that's why people drink? That's why they get into drugs. That's why entertainment is... The, it, it just boggles my mind how a man that pretends to be somebody behind the, in front of a camera gets paid more than a surgeon. A man that's actually saving lives doesn't get near the money that somebody pretending to be somebody else in front of a camera gets. Because entertainment is trying to take the, the, the pressures of the world off of people and people will throw millions and billions of dollars. The richest people on earth, a lot of them are actors. Yeah. Like what kind of crazy world are we in? <laughs> and sports, that's entertainment. It's just to get, I'll pay anything. Just get my mind off of this pressure. At home I got pressure. At work I got pressure. Entertain me, I'll pay you anything. That's the kind of world we're in. But how many know in Christ, you get all of that covered? Hallelujah. There's like a, a piece that's missing inside of us, and it's in the shape of God. And only God can fit it. And when you get that, you are satisfied. And how many know there's misery, and misery loves company? They will tear down. They will pick apart. They will run down because they're miserable. They want everybody else to be miserable. It reminds me of the devil. He's on his way to hell, and he wants to take everybody with him. How many of there's some people like that? They're on their way to hell, and they want to take everybody with them. Misery loves God. But when you get God inside of you, you've got such a satisfaction. In fact, you can get such God in you. You can have such an understanding of being a saved person that that's it. The misery has gone. And again, Michelle said that. You can have joy every day. So be honest with yourself. Do you get grouchy because there's something missing in your life? Yes, you do. <laughs> and I do too if I get grouchy. We need to really get a revelation that we've got Jesus in us. So chapter 5, when it talks about a man being driven to leave his parents and unite to his wife, is based upon what he said in chapter 1. There's something that God chose in Christ before the world began. How many know? Where, where, did, that, where did that rib come from that God made Eve out of? Adam. It was in him, right? Well, there's something that was in Christ that would also come forth and it would drive God to get back that missing piece. And what did God make out of that rib from Adam? Eve, Adam's wife. Well, what do you think? He's talking about the bride of Christ and a wife of a man in the same chapter four. If he's not trying to tell us there was something in Christ and it was brought forth and now he's driven for his bride. And the message of a man going after his wife is telling a greater message that God is going after his bride. Ooh, hallelujah. The one missing piece is found, and then the man is complete. Adam had that rib taken out of him, and when it came back to him, it wasn't the way it left him. It was formed into a woman, and he was now complete, and that's where we get the idea of the better half. There's my better half. There's, there's my missing half. 
and now I'm, and it's better than what it was when it came out of me. I know it means it's better than us, but it was also better than the way it came out of him too. I think Adam would much sooner have that woman than that curved piece of bone, right? And so that meant he was one. He, they, they will be one flesh again. What do you mean? There's two people. Could, well, she was made from his rib, so he's missing a piece. So when he gets back together with her, he's one. And that's where the idea comes from, one flesh. Somebody say we have a need. It's like we're incomplete at birth. And we desire to seek fulfillment of that craving within that we need. And, and God is like that too. That's why man who is made in God's image went through that ordeal of looking for his wife because God's trying to get a message. He said, I'm even going to make mankind in such a way that it's going to give a message of what I'm after. And he's after love. He's after his bride. It, the angels aren't made in his image. No creatures, no animals are ever made in it. Only mankind is in his image. After his kind. And God is after his image to be made complete. Somebody say, Jesus loves me. Jesus. Oh, let's clap again. Let's give him praise. You might say, God doesn't need anything. Well, in one sense, he doesn't. But he made himself have a need. He wanted that need. And does anybody remember the first prayer requests in the Lord's Prayer? After we hallow his name, after we give him glory, what's the first prayer request? Thy kingdom. Whose kingdom? God's. How many know there's part of the prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread. It talks about our needs. But before it talks anything about our needs, it's talking about his need. Are you that much aware that when you pray, don't be selfish. Gimme, 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 gimme. Here I come, Lord. Gimme, 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 gimme. <laughs> That's about the way some people pray. They might as well just say, gimme, gimme, gimme. Before you ask for your daily bread, before you ask God even to forgive you of your trespasses, ask that God's kingdom come. Ask that his will. He wants us to put his needs ahead of ours. And I already said in one sense, God doesn't have a need. But he just caused it to be that way. He wants his kingdom to come. And he needs us to pray for it. Somebody say amen. 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 If it was just going to come anyway, he wouldn't say, I want you to pray, thy kingdom come. I want you to pray, my will be done. How many know his will is just not going to be done? You ever read in Chronicles, what is it, 714? If my people, which are called by my name. Everybody say if. Yes. If. That little word is two letters, but that's big. If you pray, if you turn from your, then I will heal your land. Then I will do this. I will, but it's all based on you. If you do this, then I'll do it. And that's by the same token. If we pray, thy kingdom come, then he'll bring the kingdom. Praise God. And, you know, all our little individual needs, how many of we all get needs? You have needs, I have needs. Really, there's a bigger need than ours. And let me give you a bit of advice. If you want your little needs met, oh my, the Lord's showing me a verse right now. Ooh, getting exactly what I'm trying to say in the word. I, I don't want anyone to ever take anything I say as the word of God unless you see it for yourself in the Bible when I read it to you. Be like the Bereans. How many know Bereans never heard Paul preach that stuff? We never heard anybody preach what Paul's preaching in Acts 17. But they didn't just say, ah, I never heard that before. Go fly a kite. They searched the scriptures to see if what he was saying was true. Some people are know-it-alls, and if you tell them something they never heard before, you must be wrong. How many know God might be wanting to tell us something we never heard before? Yeah. If it's just because of something we never heard, doesn't mean it's not true. Who do we think we are? I don't know it all yet. I've been preaching for over 30 years, and I'm still learning. And praise God, folks, the moment the Spirit can't guide you into all truth because you think you know it all, the Spirit's going to find somebody else who does, and you might as well wave bye-bye to the Lord. How many want Him to lead you? Hallelujah. Praise God. And so 
all of our needs will actually be met if we go after his need first. And while I was telling you that, that scripture came to me, seek ye first the what? Kingdom. kingdom of God. Isn't that the very first prayer request? Thy kingdom come? In fact, that's the same chapter if you look at Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not your own. And all these things will be added unto you. All your needs. If you go back and read before that, it says, I clothe the lilies and I feed the fowl. All these things, your food and your clothing, everyday needs, you won't even have to ask me for that because if you seek my kingdom and my righteousness, I'll give you all those things anyway. And so, you know what a wise way to pray is? You don't even have to mention your needs. You just say, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because you told me, God, if I seek first your kingdom, all these other things will be added unto me anyway. Yeah. Ooh, let's thank God for that. Man, that's good to know. So, he's got to need it. And on the other hand, if we fail to realize this bigger need, you'll never see your individual needs solved. Your needs will be met when this bigger need is met. Now, so many Christians don't even know the big need. Uh, they think of God, well, God's there for me. What do I need God to do for me? I don't know anything else about prayer. What else do I pray for? I need this, and I, isn't that what prayer is all about? Uh, Aunt, Aunt Susie's sick, and we need to pray for Aunt Susie. And, and, and Brother So-and-So's backslid, we need to pray for him. And So-and-So's going to the hospital, or they've just got situations going on, we need to pray for the... Uh, but what else is there... For, in other words, let's just stop and think, what's God want me to pray for? What, what's that about when he says, seek first my kingdom? How do I seek his kingdom? Um, what is it that is this ultimate need that God made a man and a woman to illustrate? What is this big thing? We're, we're so shallow sometimes, and all we pray about is our needs and what we're going through, and we're so short-sighted we can no, see no further than the end of our nose, and I'm going through this, and I need prayer. And you'll see people hoard the house of God and plug it up when things are going bad. But when things are going good, their bye-bye is all the saints. But I'm telling you, when you know there's a bigger need than just our personal needs, you're going to serve God all the time. You're going to seek him because behind all of your needs, you know there's a bigger one. And I am here and I'm created for that need. And that's the need that will transform your Christian life. It'll make a firebrand out of you. It'll take you from a lukewarm Christian who might come to church once in a blue moon to somebody that's in the front lines right on the edge seeking God every day, finding a place to pray, fasting. Where do people fast and pray anymore? Fasting and prayer is becoming a lost art. And so what is this big need? And I already started talking to you about it. Something about something being in Christ that came out and he wants it back just like a man is driven. And so Christians begin thinking, what's God's will for me? Why am I here? And that's when you start getting on track. Hallelujah. When we find out what his will is, this is why we have church meetings. We find out, you've seen it over and over and over again here that God would have somebody say something that would be exactly what this pe person was going through. Exactly what that, why? Because God's getting us together and he's saying, I need things accomplished. You have to get together. Don't forsake assembling together so much more as that day is coming. And like I said earlier, now's not the time to shirk getting together for God. Of all times, now is not the time. We're so close, and, and, and God can help us, and he can minister. But beyond all of that, we understand God's major plan. The preacher preaches to you from the word, and he says, look at this. This is a mystery, but God's unveiling the mystery. He's opening it out. Seek this. I'm going to bring you into it. Seek it with everything in you, and that'll, oh my, you'll be so pleasing with what God wants to see accomplished in this world. And how many know, when you feel like you're worth something... You feel a lot better about yourself. 
How many know everybody's crying out, somebody appreciate me, somebody appreciate me? More than money, more than having your bills met. They did a survey and they found out what people want more than anything else is to feel like somebody needs them. And how much more can we feel so confident when we know God needs me and I'm going to do what he needs me to do. But if all I'm focusing on is, oh, I get a little finger ache, God, would you heal that? And I guess there's nothing else to pray for. See you next week then bless God, you're not going to be accomplishing what his will is in this world. And no wonder people go through misery. But broaden your scope this morning. Broaden and, and go back before time with me in the word of God. You see, in Ephesians 1, it says God chose us in Christ before the world began. Before he had to even save people from sin. Before sin even existed. God knew it was going to come. How many of you knew it was going to come? And he had an answer for it when he knew it was going to come. That didn't mean he wanted it to come, but he just knew it would. And there's something that he has created us to do. Does anybody have Ephesians 1 open? You have Ephesians 1 open before you? Somebody read verse 6 right away. Read it out. To the praise of his glory. Remember I emphasized that when we were reading it before. Everybody say it again. To the praise of his glory. Read verse 12. Mentioned a second time. Six verses later. That we should be to the praise of his glory. Read verse 14. Three times to the praise of his glory. Wow, there's something important there. Something important. We might just read by that before, but there's something important here. He's stressing something. This is what our part involves. He called us to the praise of his glory. Now, let me give you a hint of what he's talking about. Go to John 2, verse 11. The first miracle Jesus ever did was where? At a wedding. Woo, a man and a woman becoming one flesh. Hello. Uh, isn't that interesting? And God chose the first miracle to take place in a wedding because he's got a message he's trying to tell us. Just like Ephesians. And the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. Everybody say his glory. We are to the praise of his glory. And the very first miracle Jesus ever does is, number one, it's at a wedding. And number two, it's manifesting his glory. It's the glory of God coming out into the physical world. Jesus didn't do one miracle before that. I don't care what the myths say. I don't care what the lost books of Eden say. That's all junk. I care what the Bible says. And the Bible says the first miracle he did was at a wedding when he turned the water into wine. And it said he manifested his glory. When you manifest something, that means it's there, but it's made of visible for everybody to clearly see. How many know God's everywhere at once all over the this world he's everywhere but he's not manifesting everywhere but when we start worshiping him he starts manifesting we start feeling him we start hearing from him and Jesus first miracle manifested God's glory there's a bit of a hint of what God's after in the physical world God who's a spirit wants to influence this place and he chose to do it through human beings, through man. Miracles will happen through man. The doorway, it's like we're the doorway to the supernatural realm. Through us, he manifests his glory. And church, we're getting more and more about what our purpose is here. Mankind is predominant in that plan. He chose us above the angels to manifest his glory. He called us to the praise of his glory. Something drove his heart. Amen. And when the church is described as being in Christ before the world, that's almost identical to Eve being in Adam in the form of a rib. And we've got to look at Adam and Eve's story if we really want to understand this will of God because that's the cause for Adam and Eve coming together like this. So let's look at it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. 
And the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. He made everything else with mates. He made all the angels together. They even had angels. But the only creature that's all alone is the one that's the image of God. Hint, hint. God's the only one of his kind. He's all alone. And we'll never be God. Don't get me wrong. But he made us in his image. And he manifested something. And so it's not good that he should be alone. So I'm going to make a help that's meet or suitable for him. Keep going. So everybody say out of the ground. Oh boy. God just didn't tell you that. Just let you know we didn't come from monkeys. <laughs> out of the apes. Out of the chimps. No, out of the ground. But that's not all he told us that for. Out of the ground, he formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam. Now, why would God say it's not good man be alone, so I'm going to make him a help? Right after God says that, he takes all these animals that he made from the earth and brings them before Adam to see what Adam would call them. Why is God wanting to just see what Adam's going to say about them? After he says... It's not good that man be alone. He needs a help. So here comes all the animals. And he watches to see what Adam says. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name of it. Next verse. And Adam gave names to all cattle, fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. And then it stops and it gets back to that idea again. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. Now, what's he getting at? Let's, it's not good, Adam, be alone. Bring all these animals. They're made from the ground. By the way, they're made from the ground, everybody. But, and then Adam names them all. And God's listened to what he's saying about them. And then he says, but there wasn't a help found. It's like Adam looked at those animals for help. No, th none of this works. This, I'm still alone, God. This doesn't work. And by the way, where did he make those animals from? The ground. Read the next verse. And... The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And then God took one of his ribs, then he closed up the flesh thereof instead, and the rib which God had taken from the ground? From Adam. Okay, something's different here now. Why did it say they were made from the ground? Well, no. There's something different here. Adam was even made from the ground. And God wanted to hear what Adam said when he called all those creatures by name. But this, maybe this is going to solve the problem. The rib which he had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now all the animals had just been brought before him. Now there's something different here. And Adam said, now God was wanting to hear what Adam would say. He was listening. Oh man, are you getting this yet? Woo! He was listening to what he'd call the chimp. He was listening to what he'd call the snake. But when he took something that wasn't from the ground but was from Adam, and then he brought that, God was really listening, and I hope you're listening too. Because there's a message right there. This, this, not them, this is now bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. Not shale from shale or granite from granite. She's bone of my bones. She's flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, and all the angels are probably just on the edge of their seats. What's he going to say? And God was watching the God knew, but he wanted to hear Adam say it. He wanted to hear it come out of his mouth because there's a message that he wants us to say with our own mouths. She shall be called woman. She wasn't taken out of the ground. I don't know what the word would be if God... Named something that come out of the ground. <laughs> we come out of Canada, we're Canadians. What in the world are you if you come out of the earth? Adam. Adam means red earth. Thank you, Lord. You answered my question. <laughs> but she shall be called woman because she wasn't taken out of the ground. She wasn't taken anywhere else but out of man. And praise God, folks, there's the point right there. God's image had something taken out of him, and then when it was apart, he craved it. Keep, do we get the rest of those verses? Therefore, because she was taken from him, that's why a man will leave his father. He'll leave his mother. There's something that's driving him. I've got to be complete. I've got to be one. Bye-bye, Mom. Bye, Dad. I'm off to be one. <laughs> 
and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. He's complete now. He's one. He's satisfied. I've got the missing piece. And But it's like God says, you've got your missing piece, but I'm still looking for mine. And before Adam was even created in Christ, there was something there. It was us who were in him. Eve essentially was in Adam before she ever breathed. But when God extracted that rib and made her, she was apart from Adam. She wasn't in him anymore. But when they came back together, she was one. Folks, there was something in God called us. We were in his heart. We were in his desire. And he, he brought us out when Jesus slept the great sleep on the cross. Because just like Adam's side was opened up and from his side came a rib that he made his bride out of, Jesus' side was pierced and blood and water came out. And First John says he didn't just come from the water, but he came by water and blood. Hallelujah. How many know when he's baptized, the voice of heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he was declared to be the son of God at the water. But then when his blood was shed and he died on that cross, Amen. God once again manifested by the blood, not just water only, but water and blood. And isn't it interesting that it was water and blood that came from his side? And we're saved now. Hallelujah. Oh, let's praise him. Hallelujah. Let's praise him. Thank you, Jesus. And now, amen, he's driven to us. He's driven like Adam, like every man. And you know what's really shocking? And it's like I'm seeing something now. How many believe the Lord's coming soon? What has been one of the biggest news things in this country, in this North American continent? It happened to us 10 years ago, but it just happened to the states this year. The issue of gay rights, where the whole picture of a man cleaving to a woman is gone. The whole picture of a caused by God's great need is gone. No, folks, there's deeper implications than just somebody wanting some equal rights. There's an attack on the very purpose of God. And Satan knows exactly what he's doing when he says, a man won't leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. A man will be joined to a man. A woman will be joined to a woman. And there is an attack against the very purpose of God. No wonder we're in the day that we're in when we're now learning that this is the eternal purpose of God. And this marks the very, mars the very image of God, if you read Romans chapter 1. They change the glory of God into creeping things and beasts, Romans 1 says. And it says, then God gives them over, and women lusting after women, and men lusting after men. You don't want a wimpy preacher that's not going to tell you the truth. You want somebody that's going to preach it. And I couldn't preach anything more serious than the eternal purpose of God before he even created the world. Oh, let's give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Pray for us preachers. Pray for us preachers. We're going to come under attack, and we already are. And some will buckle up. I don't want to buckle under. I want to keep on standing and preaching the truth. And no, we don't hate those people. We love them, and don't ever treat them wrong. You love them like you love your neighbor as yourself. But we do not condone that sin. We don't. And every man alive misses something from themselves, and the woman is that missing part. And when God made us in his image, he's showing us his needs. And that's why Ephesians 1 and 4 says, He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. We were in him, now he wants to see us before him. Oh man, the Holy Spirit's showing me something else. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Jesus despised the shame. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Eve used to be in Adam, but now she was standing before him, and that was his joy. That's why he laid his life down in a deep sleep. And you want to know why Jesus laid his life down to die on the cross? Is because you're the bride. And one day, through that sleep, through that death, something would come out of him, and then it would be set before him. And so it's, oh man, the Holy Ghost is showing me right now. Thus saith the Lord your God, I would speak to you this day. When I came in flesh and died as a man, I was showing my will. I was going through the very thing that I had planned from eternal ages in the past. Before I said, let there be light, 
you were on my mind. Before I said, let the waters under be divided from the waters, you were on my mind, my people. And I say to you, saith your God, that you are the single most important thing in my in my spirit, in my heart. And I love you with a love that you'll never comprehend. And if you could only grasp what I'm trying to say this day to you, my people, you would know how much I love you and you would love me in return. You would run to me and wrap your arms around me, saith your God. You would hold on to me and be me, be worth more than all the world to you. Like you are worth all the world to me, more than the world. And I distinctly had my apostle write those words so that he was describing that work of the cross when he talked about the joy. You are my joy beyond any angel could ever be. You are my joy beyond what any other creature ever is. You are my people. You're my church. You're my bride, saith your God. Woo! Oh, let's praise God. Oh, oh. Woo! Hallelujah! You don't know what just happened. That was a spirit of prophecy just come into this place. How many are glad he loves us with a never-ending love? Let's all stand to our feet right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Let's clap unto him and give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Oh, hallelujah, God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, folks, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I pray, God, give me a message for today. God, speak to me. I have never felt the anointing like I just felt in this service since we've been in Sydney. Ooh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh my, if your heart isn't where it should be with the Lord this morning, like Walter said, he goes out for the ones that aren't home, and he's saying, come home. Amen. Eve came home when her Adam came together. Amen. We come home when we go to Jesus. And so I want you to talk to the Lord right now. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to touch your heart and renew a right spirit in you. Ask him to make everything clean again, that you've missed him, and oh, hallelujah. And you might have been sitting in this congregation every time we had service, but it doesn't necessarily mean your heart's where it should be either. No, I didn't know anything. Nobody told me anything. But I do feel the presence of the Lord telling us, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And he's coming for his lady. He's coming for that bride that thinks more of him than all the world. And he said, remember Lot's wife. Why do you, what did Lot's wife fail in? What did she do? She turned back. Why would she turn back? Because her heart belonged there. Folks, does your heart belong in this world? I don't want to turn back because I, I really believe with everything in me that if there's something in this world we're going to miss, then God says, okay, I might as well just leave you with the world then when I take my church. If you want to miss it that bad, I'm going to leave you with it. Three words, remember Lot's wife. And if you're hungry for God and you've just feasted a little bit more this morning, I don't know about you, but I feasted a whole lot right now. <laughs> Let's just thank God that he loves us with a never-ending love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The spirit of prophecy is still on me. Thus saith the Lord your God, after I cursed the serpent, after I cursed the woman, and after I cursed the ground for man's sake, I was still listening to hear what Adam would call his wife. After all of that, Adam spoke these words, she shall be called Eve, the mother of all living. And that was the message I was wanting to come out. Even before he spoke that she was from his body, 
there was more to that word. And when he uttered her name, after all of the cursings, after all of the sin, after all of the judgments, it shone forth a light of hope. The first prophecy of the Messiah would be that I would crush the serpent's head. And then when Adam, my image, said that she is Eve, meaning the mother of all living, I came that you might have life, people, and that you might have it more abundantly. And through humanity, I came into this world as your Savior. And you are my bride because of it. Let my will, let my kingdom come, saith your Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, let's thank him right now for speaking. Thank him right now for speaking. Thank you, Jesus.